So welcome to another episode of HIDAC webinar. My name is Ali Nijat and I'm HIDAC National Development Manager for Industrial Hydraulics. And this episode of the webinar focuses on uh, some guidelines and principles of designing uh, safety of the machinery. In fact, this is a very, very complex subject. And this presentation is just to provide you with some basic guidelines around those ideas and concepts and, and get you to start thinking down the path of applying those principles. Machine safety, a topic of today's today's webinar. Just a very quick disclaimer. Again, the content that we're providing through this webinar is just for general information only and uh, is provided to you as guidelines. It is going to be your individual responsibility to seek out for advice and, and assistance and adhere with rules and regulations applicable to your local area, your country, and your specific sector of the industry. Uh, what we will be presenting as part of this webinar is just some ideas around the importance of machine safety and why is it important to apply those ideas when we're designing and engineering new systems. We have a very brief look at the standards that are in place to harmonize these concepts across the globe. You have a look at the methods of risk assessment and, and risk categories and understanding what actually a risk category means and what implications it has in terms of machine design. We look at safety integrity level and performance level and some of the definitions applicable to these areas. And ultimately, we finish off with some examples again, as, as usual. So importance of machine safety. I guess we have all seen uh, some examples of where machine safety actually let us down. You know, we've seen tumbled over excavators, we've seen, you know, tripped over uh, wheel loaders, you know, also the different machineries and all sorts of different incidents in the industry that is associated with either unsafe use of the machinery or, you know, some fundamental flaws to the design of those equipment, which can eventually cause harm and, and damage to the property, to the life and health and well-being of the personnel working around them. I guess when I personally want to design a system, I have one motto, which uh, is inspired by this gentleman. I'm not sure if you recognize the face, but you certainly recognize the name. Murphy. So it's not that he came up with these laws. These principles are associated with his name because he was experimenting some new measurement devices. And some of the actual principles came through adoption of these devices, you know, was adversely used and their association with the name Murphy then. So Murphy Law, I guess we are all fairly familiar with that. Whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. And at the worst possible time, in the worst possible way. And that is very, very true. So it is up to us as engineers and designers, and let's bring this to the engineering world to make sure that we actually see through the functionality of the machine, and what can potentially go wrong as part of the operation that can eventuate in, in damaging some cause and harm. So effectively, the machine safety is uh, our principles to prevent injury, first and foremost. You know, the injuries can be also different things, you know, falling, crushing, moving parts, short circuit, and electric circuit, you know, sharp edges, all sorts of different things, unpredicted uh, movements of machine parts, and all of them can lead in some sort of injury, potentially. We want to be able to protect our personnel's health and safety in the long term, you know, over the duration of the course of people using those equipment and machineries. We want to minimize the potential of any hazardous future uh, events and preventing, obviously, personnel from entering those potentially hazardous areas and, and, you know, the perimeters around the machine which might be dangerous to enter. And a very important attribute to, to the machine safety is just achieving a predictable outcome. In other words, you know, increasing the probability of safety functions that we've got in place to perform satisfactory when we actually want them to perform. When we want to shut something down, I want to make sure when I press that emergency button, that function is actually shut down. How can I ensure that happens? Some of these ideas, and specifically, again, obviously all leading to the point that we want to protect personnel and property around it, but how to regulate it is uh, covered in a number of different standards across the globe. And we have a very brief look at the titles of these standards. You don't really need to memorize any of these names, but further down the track, when we get to the principal concepts uh, applied in, in the world of machine safety, some of these names will be useful 
So in a worldwide scale, we've got IEC 61508. So this is a general standard and it's based on some statistical approaches to achieve basically machine safety and certain safety levels. It contains some procedures and some methods to estimate the actual reliability of different parts and also how we can test their quality and you know how we can find out whether they are or they're not intact when they're cold full. In Europe, we've got EN13849. That is very much based on the same principles as IEC 61508, but it's primarily focusing on machinery's control systems and the safety functions designed around that. In Australia, we've got AS4024.1, and that's a different divisions of this standard. This is, again, a standard which is uh, written around safety of machineries and provides some essential frameworks around designing and operating safe machine systems. Uh, it applies single items to machinery or grouping of the machineries, and what it makes sure is if you've got a number of different machineries working in conjunction with each other, there are certain interlocks in place, so the operation of one cannot interfere with another one and as a result cause you know safety sense then we look at sector specific one so IEC or ENIC 620061 this is mainly derived from the actual 61508 and it's very much written around the electrical control systems you know how to examine the overall life cycle of for, you know from the actual concept phase all the way to the commissioning again that's that's what i was suggesting earlier that we when we're designing a system we want to see uh, that through through its entire operation life cycle and just make sure at various stages it is a safe to use type machine so this is pretty much an overview to the standards now we are in australia and as such we want to focus on as4024 and have a look at some of the guidelines that this provides. So really the objective of most of these standards is to minimize risk, right? So it just provides us with some ideas, you know, us as designers, engineers, manufacturers, importers of the units, whoever carries some sort of a responsibility across the board, provides us with some guidelines on to how to minimize risk and to protect health and safety of people dealing with those machineries. Well, this is really achieved by providing technical principles for the design and safety related parts of the control system. Now, this is pretty much the, the guidelines around process, you know, involved in designing such systems. So if a designer was to design a machine and do a risk assessment all the way to the end, the first step is actually performing the hazard analysis and the risk assessment. Right. So we look at different aspects of the in operation. We perform hazops and also the different discussions to make sure that we actually cross the T's and dot the I's through the process. Now, as part of that, we may identify uh, any, you know, certain areas that we can eliminate the risk by the process of elimination or reduction. You know, uh, some examples of that are down here on this slide. For example, the geometry and the visibility, which, which basically includes visibility, uh, contact areas, traveling, etc. Uh, look at this cooler arrangement here. You know, the, so the, the risk of having the operator's finger chopped up by the by the blade is is simply mitigated by putting uh, this protecting grill around around the fans, and that is a simple task that we can perform and eliminate a lot of risk. So that's just good enough. In terms of physical, you know, we've got limiting what it can do in terms of forces, speed. Let's take a press for as an example. You know, maybe if the speed of the operation of that press is too fast, you know, the op operator cannot quite work around it. So by bringing down the speed, maybe reduce the forces of operation in a, in a way that it's less of a risk to the operator can be some sort of a, a preventing measure. Emissions, vibration, noises, you know, they are all the items that we actually look at when it comes to the design of a system and also adhering to the designer standards. Very, very important. You know, if I'm designing a vessel like this, I tend to look at the design codes for pressure vessels and see how supports are welded, how the nozzles are welded, you know, what thickness of the material we have to use, what does lifting entails and all sorts of different things. In terms of technical aspects of a design, Obviously, choosing the right technology is the most important. You know, sometimes maybe make, uh, hydraulic is too dangerous, maybe because there is high pressure hoses running around the joint and, and the operator, you know, decides to, or the design principle decides to change the operation from hydraulic to some electromechanic or the other way around, you know. So applying and adopting the actual right process is a very important and creative part of the process itself. 
in terms of electrical, you know, some of the very proven concepts, things like e-stops or light curtains or manual resets, you know, they're all proven concepts that can prevent injury in a, in a long run. Or, you know, when we look at maintenance and ergonomics, you know, again, look at this vessel here. So this is a filter housing. It's a diesel filter housing. In fact, this was designed collaboration, you know, between Hydac Germany and Hydac Australia. And you can see to change the filter elements in this housing, we're going to have to undo all these bolts and remove the lid. Now, this lid is supported by this stabbit arm. So, you know, when we undo the bolts, this is not going to fall on anyone's toes or cause any injury. In fact, the ergonomics of it is also fairly convenient because the operator can just simply pivot along that uh, pivot point here and support it with the davit arm and move the lid away. Once the filter elements change, we can put that back on again. So these are some of the very, very basic measures that we can put in place. But now going back to this slide, uh, sometimes we just simply cannot eliminate the uh, the root cause or, or the risk from the process. Then we're going to have to look at putting in some control measures, you know, and what that entails is, you know, specifying the safety requirements in terms of characteristics of the safety functions, realization of safety functions, and selection of categories. So this is important. We'll get to that what it means, you know, different categories of risk and what implications it has. And then design the safety related parts of the system around those categories and, and around those realized risks. Moving on, once that's done, we have to validate the achieved functions, right? Uh, and this is very much part of the actual, you know, certification of the safety rated system that, you know, you design a system in accordance with some principles. And then once the design is complete and the machine is manufactured, the inspector will come and they do the start of the process, which they refer to as fault injection. So they introduce different you know, elements of risk or different scenarios to the machine, and they study and investigate the behavior of the machine reacting to those particular events. Now, let's have a look at the first part, which is the risk assessment and the risk categories. When we talk about risk assessment, we always talk about three different very important parameters there. The first one is the likelihood of risk, you know, how likely that event to happen, right? And the frequency of that to happen, you know, how often I uh, expect that particular risk to be imposed. Last but not least is the severity of the risk, you know, what impact it will have if it happens, right? Then what we do again, and this is, this is part of the clause five uh, uh, of that Australian standard, we'll just put that into a matrix. So again, you can see the severity of there, the frequency and the possibility, which is the same as likelihood. So we always start with the severity and very quickly we can, we can divide that into two sections. If the risk is not going to be severe in terms of causing injury, then automatically we move into the first row here, which then identifies the risk category as being or we, we categorize risk by, by these categories, B, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So no severe, uh, the, the risk is not going to be that severe, and the likelihood of it is not really that, that likely to happen, then the category would be B. If it's likely to happen, and if it's frequently going to happen with very low severity, then we look at the risk category of 1. Then moving on, if the risk is going to be then severe and it's going to have some severe impact on the life or, you know, potentially some injury to the personnel, then we categorize that into two sections, uh, which is now divided to the frequency and the duration of exposure to the hazard. Again, the higher the frequency, obviously, the more severe the risk category is going to be. And again, each one of these two sections then will be divided to the possibility of avoiding the hazard. If it's highly likely that we can avoid the hazard, P1, then the risk category is of less value uh, in terms of what they categorize it with, you know, B1 or 2. And as the actual possibility of avoiding hazards become less and less, then we move up the chain to the higher risk categories. So important to remember, that we've got five different risk categories of B, one, two, three, and four, which are functions of likelihood, frequency, and the severity of risk. So what does risk category mean? So risk category is the classification of the safety related parts of a control system in respect to their resistance to fault and their subsequent behavior 
in a fault condition. So very important key words here. We've got resistance to faults and their subsequent behavior in the fault condition. Now let's have a look at and see what each one of these risk categories entail. Now I want to design a system around different risk categories. What should they consider? So for category B, which was the lowest in terms of risk categories, we need to make sure that parts of the control system, and this is this is typically what we're presenting here is revolving around the control systems. So parts of the control system will be designed in accordance with relative standards. So it means that if I want to design a risk-based design, and I do my risk assessment and put it in a matrix and come up with the risk category B, then I have to choose certain parts of the system in compliance with certain standards. So not really, really high in terms of what I have to adhere with. The next one up the chart, uh, category one, then it is very similar to the category B, but in addition, we have to use some well-tried components. Now, what does well-tried components mean? It means we've got, we've produced enough of them and we put them to enough hours of tests and, and number of cycles uh, that we have some proven data as to what is the mean time to failure of this particular part? What is the mean time to dangerous failure? You know, we've got all sorts of different data. We understand what is the actual failure rate of these components. And they're basically forming this idea of well-tried component. Now, obviously, certain brands have an association with uh, well-tried components. Like, you know, we all know an Apple phone is much better than the rest, or maybe it's some people are using Samsung. Either way, when compared with the rest of the market, you know, the, major, the, the majority of the population are using that, and there is a brand association. So sometimes brand is actually safeguarding this idea of the well-tried components. Now, category two, same as above, same as category one, with some safety function checks at suitable intervals. So now I've used some of the world's tried components, but at, at the same time, I actually want to run a, run a random check every now and then on this system to make sure that the system responds the way it has to respond to. Category three, and this is as we go up the chain, obviously, the architecture of the system becomes more complex and each category obviously comes with its own price tag, you know, because there is a lot involved in this just designing the system, let alone manufacturing and the construction of it. So category three, it's same as category two, but we have to have some warnings and detectable faults, right? So if there is a fault happening in the system, I have to be able to detect that and generate some warnings so the operator or the owner of that asset knows that there's something going wrong, you know, but typically a single fault wouldn't compromise, you know, the safety of that, the architecture. But over time, if the number of faults increase and accumulates, then we may compromise the actual safety of the system. And then we've got category four, which is in that case, similar to the above, but faults in this case are unable to accumulate. Now, what that means is the behavior is characterized by continued performance of the safety function in the presence of a single fault. So detection of fault in time to prevent the loss of the safety function. So the accumulation of uh, undetected faults is taken into account. What it means is, if a single fault happens, right, it is not going to have an impact on the integrity of the safety function in play. In saying that, the single fault is not going to have a knock-on effect on the next fault and so on. Let's have a look at the safety integrity level and performance level, some definitions and how they go hand in hand with different safety categories. We're going to quickly go through these couple of slides, very important definitions. If you want to enter that world, you need to understand what each one of these terms actually mean. So safety integrity is the probability of safety function being performed satisfactory under all stated conditions within a stated period of time. So things shouldn't go wrong. Everything has to perform uh, in accordance with our expectation. Now, safety integrity level is a discrete level, uh, typically from one to four, so seal one, two, three, and four, that, and are specifying the safety integrity requirement of safety function to be allocated to the safety related system. So seal four in this case is going to become the most basically reliable in terms of our safety integrity, and seal one is probably the bottom of the list. 
performance level is a discrete level used to specify the ability of safety related parts to control the system to perform a safety function under foreseeable condition. Similar to, to SEAL, we've got different levels and they're categorized by, by letters. So performance level A, B, C, D, E, and going up the chart basically we increase our performance level. Diagnostic coverage, very, very important. That's the ratio between the detectable dangerous or detected dangerous failures and the failure rate of total dangerous failures. So the ones that we can detect and the ones that we cannot detect. That ratio is the diagnostic coverage. Then we've got mean time to failure. These are more familiar terms, you know, and, and sometimes published for some of the equipment, you know. Uh, mean time to failure is expected time or expectation of the mean time to failure. Uh, MTTFD, that's mean time to dangerous failure, similar to the above, but this one is dangerous. PFHD, that's probability of dangerous failure per hour. And we've got CCF, which is common cause of failure. So just have these ones off the back of your mind. Moving forward, we'll actually use this one in some of the slides. The last one is SRPCS, which is safety related parts of control system. Now, going back to, to the performance level and safety integrity level, because these two are two concepts that we will be maneuvering around. So performance level is determined for a safety critical function on the basis of hazard and risk analysis. So the way that we actually define the performance level is we look at the actual, this idea, PFHD. Remember, PFHD is the probability of dangerous failure per hour. So for the probability of dangerous failure per hour in between one to 10,000 to one to 100,000, the performance level is A. It means it's basically when compared with a higher level, it's more likely that we have a, a dangerous occurrence in those hours. Now, as we move up the chain, higher performance level, they have less likelihood of those events to happen within, within those time frames. With SEAL, it's fairly similar. Safety integrity level is then determined for each safety critical functions. And then, then that again ranges from one to four, and that comes down to basically the probability of dangerous failures per hour. So the higher the probability, the lower the actual SEAL rating. The fundamental differences between SEAL and PL, PL is derived from ENISO 13849, and SEAL is derived from IEC, uh, mostly similar in terms of concept, but important to remember, SEAL is not covering the non-electrical items like hydraulics. Hydraulics is typically covered by PL. We're talking about hydraulic components, not a hydraulic control system. What controls a hydraulic system? It's an electrical system, which is now governed by SEAL again. So this table, again, very quickly, provides you with an insight as to where, you know, these different standards and it can see the applicability of these standards to different sections and different industry sectors, you know, electricals, electromechanical, uh, for example, hydraulic is not covered by IC 62061, you know, whereas it's covered by the AS standard. Now, how does SEAL and performance level go hand in hand with safety categories, right? So there is no direct correlation between the safety categories and, and SEAL, but there is no direct correlation between safety categories and SEAL. However, there is a real correlation between safety categories and performance level, and there is a correlation between performance level and SEAL. So as a result, there is a correlation. So we'll get to that in a second. So here is a very quick guide that, all right, if I've got system with a safety category of B, the control system around it has to have a performance level of either A or B. Remember, A being the least performance level and E being the highest. As we move up the chain, so uh, safety category one has to have a control system performance level B or C. And it gets really complex, right, and open to interpretation. But there is another graph that provides us with a better insight as to as to how we interpret this. So down the bottom, we've got the safety categories. So B1 to 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and 4, 4. But you can see they've been split between different diagnostic coverage. Remember, diagnostic coverage was the ratio between detectable dangerous failures 
and the total the interest values, right? So the higher the coverage rate, that means the, the more visibility that we actually have through the operation of the system. So let's take this as an example. We have a, a risk assessment. We've identified that, yep, the risk category for this system is two. We know we can implement diagnostic coverage of medium, and then, and that's typically a percentage because it's just a ratio. Uh, and then we look at the mean time to dangerous failure, and we've got low, medium, high, and low, medium, high is categorized here in this table. That low mean time to dangerous failure means anything between three years to 10 years. High mean time to dangerous failures, you know, high safety rating between 30 years to 100 years, right? So I don't see any failure or the probability of that is very, very low if the mean time to failure data is just uh, is very high. So if I architect my system, in a risk category two with medium diagnostic coverage with components which are of very high mean time to failure to dangerous failure then the performance level of that is very high you can see it's pretty much around d but the lower the mean time to dangerous failure goes the lower the actual performance level so it's pretty much common sense then the relationship between PL and SEAL. So there is a direct correlation. PLA, there is no correspondence between SEAL and PL. And as we go up the chain, B, C, D, E, they respectively correspond with uh, different levels of SEAL. So PLE, which is pretty high and very expensive to implement, it's corresponding with SEAL 3. So we'll look at actually where in a real life applications we've got these different performance levels in SEAL. So these snapshots provide you with some understanding as to where and how we use different safety integrity levels and different performance levels. Now, the first column here, failure rate, you can see pretty 10 to the power, power of minus 9. So this is 1 in 10,000, 10 to the power of minus 4. Aerospace, they've got their own standards, right? I'm not recommending that you actually read them in your own time, fairly significant. But you can see, as we go up the chain, the highest level being A, we haven't gone through that system of interpretation, you can see the failure rate goes significantly lower. Now, when it comes to the PL, so this is this is where probably hydraulics are, you know, or electric systems, snow groomers, you know, are, are rated in that category between CL1 and CL2 and covering from performance level B to performance level D. So the likelihood of failure is 1 in 10 to the power of minus 7. So again, very low and still much, much, much lower than something like a Boeing 787. Right, the, the power system in Boeing 787 is the highest reliability you can see, and that's why we can get on the planes with a peace of mind without worrying about things going wrong dramatically. Now, moving on again in the automotive space, we've got again different standard ISO 262662, they have their own interpretation of the events, and they do also correlate with SEAL and PL. So really, having a look at this data here, compliance to SEAL 3 means that one dangerous error within 10 to the power of 7 operating hours is acceptable. That's, that's quite reliable to me. Now, some examples. But before we actually get to the real-life examples, I just want to introduce a concept for you. And that's the designated architecture of these systems. Now, if I've got a safety category 1, what would be the fundamental differences in the architecture of that system with a safety category four? So the design architectures are divided into five categories. So B, one, two, three, four. And if you remember, they were the risk categories, right? These categories describe which diagnostic and redundancy systems must be available in the system. So let's have a look at the architecture of risk category B and one. So very, very simple. So imagine this is a PLC, right? Or a sensor or some sort of a control system, right? It's as simple as having an input signal processing. So that's a logic or a PLC or sensor or whatever you want to call it, you know? And then we've got an output signal, right? So pressure comes in, gets processed, comes out in a format of four to 20 milliamp, right? Now, when we move up the chain and to, to higher safety categories, for example, this is, this is the architecture of category two, you can see the system and the control diagram becomes a little bit more complex, right? Now, not only we actually have the architecture of the system one, but we've got some additional stuff in here. The controller itself, it produces a test stimulus, you know, so 
it actually can test the reaction of itself to an input signal and the result of it and also monitor the result of it and, and checks the validity and health of its operation. In addition, they may have some test equipment built into it, you know, which performs some additional testing functions on top of what the actual PLC does as part of a self-diagnostic. Now, when we talk about architecture category three, that becomes even more complex, right? We don't only have a singular input, we actually have two different inputs two processes and we've got two outputs with monitoring the output right and what happens here is between the actual two processes they constantly cross check the data with each other just to make sure that both of them are producing meaningful and intact data now you may notice that the actual monitoring line is dotted the monitoring is our diagnostic coverage right so you may have diagnostic coverage on one output channel or the other one or you know limited diagnostic on both but when we move up the chain again to category four you can see it's the same architecture but what we've improved here is the diagnostic coverage right so the higher remember the higher the diagnostic coverage the higher reliability now some real life examples in the world of HIDAC, we've got also different instrumentation like pressure sensors we've got of the PLD and CL2, again, another type of pressure transmitter, you know, this is series 8,000, series 4,000 is again PLD. You can see mean time to dangerous failure, 976 years. That means you put one of these pressure transmitters in there and forget about it forever. Position switches, we've got linear position transmitters, you know, uh, for fitting inside the cylinders, for example, of very high performance level and seal, and also the valve position switches of, of the PLD, performance level D, again, very high. And also some of our controllers, uh, we'll get that in a, in a second. Now, remember those system architectures, the same principle applies here. So CAT1, we've got one input, and this is our standard sensors, right? One input pressure comes in, gets processed, comes out to 4 to 20 milliamp. Category 2, still one basically DMS sensor says a cell, but what we have in there is the self-diagnostic basically measures for testing and verifying the signal, right? And one sig one signal come out. That's category two. Then the category three, remember we had two DMS measuring cells measuring pressure individually. They go to two separate processes. Basically reading of the two processes or the operation of them are getting cross-checked by each other. And the out we have two separate outputs as well. And we also measure the actual output signal with, a, with that coverage. So again, this is HDA 8000. You can see that in principle, the, this sensor has a very high performance level, PLD, a CL2 in accordance with those standards that we outlined earlier. One sensor cell, one circuit board with monitoring electronics. See, that's the TE here, yeah? for monitoring and test trigger signal, right? It just verifies its health uh, of the actual processor itself. So that corresponds with architecture level two. So in terms of controllers, again, the same principle applies. Let's imagine, you know, build a system full of fancy seal rated system. If you don't have a brain for that system, which has that high level of safety integrity level being the controller, then really the effectiveness of that control system is compromised. So you can, you know, if you think about different architectures of the system, category two has self-diagnostic or category three has two different processes, right? So you can technically put in two standard processes and get them to talk and verify each other's readings, or you can come down to something like this H1, uh, the TTC90, which already has all those measures in place. You can see the input signal again, the processor, and we've got the monitoring test and diagnostic happening you know inside the processor and that unit is rated for seal 2 now some real industry specific standards we all know that you know for gas turbines for steam turbines over speeding is is an issue you know over speeding can happen when we send a shutdown order to the turbine but the turbine doesn't want to obey right and that can be as a result of different things you know the lightning induced power surge fault pilot valve electrical fault you know operation failures and things like that now let's have a look at one of the solutions that Hilac has developed this is very much designed around that principle let's say we, we have a, a turbine shutdown procedure is a hydraulically applied actuator right and a spring released so when we relieve the hydraulic pressure we shut down the turbine so let's have a look at this principle here this is 
what they call it, uh, basically two out of three voting system. So this is a self-testing and self-monitoring monitoring system. We have the pressure line coming in after the turbine actuator valve, and we've got a drain line here. Now, in normal operation, what's happening is all these valves are closed, and this is only to operate one actuator, right? If the oil path is open to the tank, the actuator is uh, offloaded and the turbine is shut down, right? But we can't obviously afford testing all these valves together uh, when we are running the turbine, right? So therefore, we have the two, three, which is basically three parallel legs, two in series. And what we do here is testing and measuring the operation of all of these valves. Again, look at this. This is not necessarily comprising of safety rated components, right? But the actual architecture of the system presents the architecture of a safety system, right? And I'll explain that to you. So in a normal operation when a turbine is running, all of these valves are energized, meaning the actual the path from the actuator valve to the tank is blocked because these, by, these guys are energized, right? And in that case, all these pressure transmitters or pressure switches or whatever they, you want them to be, they are reading zero pressure because this valve is blocked. We've got the pressure here. Now, I want to test these valves. What I do, I quickly de-energize this one. So uh, the oil pressure then is induced in this line here, but blocked by this one because I haven't de-energized this. So the pressure transmitter will see, aha, I've got pressure. That means valve A1 works fine, right? I energize it again and block it. Then what I do, I will just de-energize this valve here, right? And what it does, it just drains the pressure and the sensor says, aha, uh -huh, valve number C2 now works because the pressure is, is relieved, right? And we can just do basically cross check between each leg without draining the pressure line going to the turbine actuator valve. We can test every individual valve here. We can test tightness of all of these pressure sensors and make sure everything works fine. So in that one critical moment, when I press the stop button and I want to shut down my, my turbine, I can make sure that the system works fine without any issue. All the valves are performing because I've tested them on a regular basis. All the sensors are working. And if anything happens along the way, I have the chance and opportunity to go and replace one of these valves without having to take, a, you know, bring down the turbine and shut it down for maintenance. So that comprises a seal three, actually, system. Very high in terms of monitoring, good diagnostic coverage, self-testing, self-diagnostic, and a very high level of safety. That brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and have a great day.